Last week I published a video about the Sunto MB6 compass and in that video I referred to it as a military compass and since then I've had lots of DMs and emails all asking virtually the same question. What is the difference between a military compass and a civilian compass? So rather than answering each message individually, I thought I'd give it a go um, to make a video that then we'll go through the answer. So first off, to clarify, there isn't a strict rule separating military and civilian compasses. You can use a military compass for hiking and you can use a civilian compass for military purposes. However, I would say it's using the right tool for the right job just makes things easier and I do like things to be easier. So now before we go any further I, I want to emphasize that these are just my ideas you know and I could be wrong. So if you've got your own insights into the difference between military and civilian compasses you know let, share them in the comments box. I would say the fundamental difference between a military and a civilian compass at its most basic level is that they're designed to do different things. As an example, these are designed to be civilian compasses and these are designed to be military compasses. Now, many websites will go on and on and page after page trying to give a technical explanation of this topic. But I believe in keeping things simple. You know, <laughs> as the saying goes, if you can't explain something simply, it's because you don't really understand it. So I'm going to simply, I need some, <laughs> should, I should have got this sorted out before I started. Oh yeah. So I'm going to use, here we go, here's one. I'm going to use this rock <laughs> to explain the difference between military and civilian compass. As you can see, it's a fine, it's a fine rock. And yes, I know, I know. <laughs> if you watch real YouTube channels, they will have lots of highly technical equipment with green screen backgrounds and, you know, lasers and AI graphics and a big desk with a very impressive microphone. <laughs> I get a rock. <laughs> oh, well. Now, imagine this rock represents a location. If I throw this rock, it will land somewhere and that creates a point of interest. So here we go, I'm going to throw this rock and where it lands, we'll go and have a look. Ah, <laughs> I really should plan. The rock has rolled down a bank. Oh, <laughs> we'll go and get it, hang on. Where's my rock? Oh, there it is. <laughs> oh, wow, look at this. I actually didn't, here's the rock. <laughs> this is, um. This is a man-made terrace, look at this. And there's, an, there's, there's a row of them going down the hill that way. Put my rock over here. These are, you can find, sorry, <laughs> sorry to interrupt your military and civilian compass video with a bit of waffle. <laughs> you, you can find these sort of terraces all over the world. You know, wherever people needed to farm on sloping ground, you know, wherever people needed to stop the, the water running away too quickly or to stop soil erosion. Um, and in this area, these, these terraces, flat, the flat areas, the strips of land, these are called lynchets. Um, it's a term derived from the Anglo-Saxon hilinch, which just means a ridge, you know. Um, wow, I honestly didn't know these were here. Look at this. <laughs> Amazing. Some of the lynchets in this area, they, they date all the way back to the Neolithic period, so they're thousands of years old. But most of them were created during the Anglo-Saxon period and onwards. So from about 500, the year, the year 500 up to about 1200, you know. Before the monasteries arrived and took over, <laughs> most of this area was, it was, what's the word, common land. And the villagers, the villagers would divide this common land up into strips if it was on a slope, um, with each family using their assigned strips to grow crops on or graze animals. I just find this amazing. This <laughs> I really didn't know this was here, you know. But not obviously not all of the strips of land were equally productive. So to ensure families were given the chance to grow enough crops and graze their animals, they would rotate the, the strips each year so that 
each family would get a, a turn on the very productive strips and also on the less productive strips. This was known as doing their stint. Have you heard that expression? It, stint comes from the Viking word stinta. Anyway, now in this area, I don't know about other areas in the world, the, these terraces were abandoned after the plague, you know, the Black Death, and this swept through England in about 1350. And as the plague killed around half of the population of England, so afterwards there were fewer people to farm the land. And those that survived moved down, you know, down into the valley floor, you know, to more fertile areas. Um, also, some of them went off and for the first time sought employment with large landowners, you know, for cash payments. And as a result, these lynchets were, they were abandoned. But you can still see them, you know, <laughs> took a lot of work to move this, so they've become part of the landscape. And if you close your eyes, you can actually imagine Anglo-Saxon farmers guiding massive oxen as they ploughed the fields or harvesting hay with scythes, you know, in the late summer. And it's, it's just amazing to think how much history is actually embedded in the landscape, you know. <laughs> Oh, well, let's get back up there. I'll take my rock back. <laughs> Sorry. To, <laughs> I, shouldn't, I shouldn't interrupt these very serious videos. Well, <laughs> with a rock. I'll take my rock back up there and we'll crack on. What an amazing find. Lynchets in this area. Oh, <laughs> don't forget, as I always say, everywhere you go, not just in England, everywhere, within a short distance from where you are, there is something interesting. <laughs> what was I saying? Oh yeah, military and civilian compasses. Let's, <laughs> now I've got my rock back. <laughs> so this rock, if I throw it, I shan't throw it again, but this rock, wherever it is, this represents a location. So I won't throw it again, it'll disappear. I'll put it down here. There you go, so our rock's on the floor there. Now. A civilian compass is designed to help you find that rock. Okay, you might want to walk to it, or you might want to find it on a map, that location, or you may want to find a cafe that's nearby to your rock, you know. So it's all about getting from point A to point B, you know, from somewhere to somewhere else. Oh, I'm being heckled by a herd of cows. <laughs> on the other hand, a military compass is designed to determine the rock's exact location. So, you know, so that you can smash it. <laughs> you know what I mean. You know, whether this means physically reaching it or calculating the distances and directions and coordinates of that rock, you need to be able to target it accurately. Now, these different needs, civilian versus military precision, are why compasses are designed differently. For military purposes, accuracy and speed are paramount. Is that a good word? Yeah, they are paramount. And this is why civilian compasses, you know, are normally used in conjunction with a protractor. You know, while good quality civilian compasses will normally have a base plate, which is essentially, it's a simplified protractor. It's also why civilian compasses use degrees and military compasses use mills. You know, when I'm out walking around the hills, I use, usually just glance at my map, you know, pick a direction and start walking. And if I need a little bit more precision, say I'm walking in reduced visibility or I'm trying to find a very specific spot, then I'll use my compass and I might walk, walk on a bearing of one, two, three in that direction or three, four, five in that direction. What I won't do is worry about fractions of a degree, you know, and for most civilian purposes, whole number degrees are all that is needed. However, for the military, um, degrees simply aren't accurate enough, and they're also quite complex to do calculations with, especially in high stress situations. As an example, let's say somebody gives you a, a bearing of 123.45 degrees. That actually means 123 degrees and 27 minutes, because each degree can be divided into 60 minutes. And it's this level of complexity that can lead to errors. And in the military, that can have serious consequences. You know, and there's a good reason why military compasses are designed to be more accurate. As an example, the rocks, 
<laughs> the rock's over there. Let's say that I threw my rock at a target that was 10 kilometers away. And I'm, I make an error in the direction that I threw my rock. Let's say I made an error by just, just one degree over 10 kilometers. Give me 30 seconds. So one degree, that's 10, that's pi. I would miss my target to the left or to the right by 174 meters. You know, and that is unacceptable in um, you know, the modern days. And this is where mills come in. Now, to understand why the military use mills, let's, you know, let's take a quick look at the maths. A circle, as you know, I'll, what I'll do is I'll put some graphics on your screen while I'm chatting. A circle is divided into 360 degrees. It's, it's a system probably inherited from the Babylonians. However, for military applications, this isn't precise enough. You know? Instead, the military use a unit called a mill radian or a mill. You know, mills are based on the geometry of a circle. Imagine you're standing at the center of a circle, you know, and the world is spread out around you. You know, you can imagine it as being a very large circle. The distance from where you are at the center of the circle to any point on the circle's edge is called the radius. And if you measure around the edge of the circle, you know, the circumference, the same distance as the radius, the angle created between the start of the measurement and the end of the measurement is called a radian. If you measure half of the distance of the radius and put it around the edge of the circle, that angle would be a half radian. But what the military have done is they've divided the radius up into 1,000 you know, and the length of one thousandth of the radius positioned on the edge, the two points at the start and the finish of the, uh, of the arc, that is known as a mill radian. Okay, now that is a very, very small angle which ally, allows for finer measurements than degrees. You know, the problem is there are 6,283 mill radians in a circle. So for simplicity and to make them usable, the military normally rounds that number up to 6,400, and these are known as NATO mills. Different countries like Russia and China and what have you, they round them to different things, but in most of the NATO countries, they will round 6,283 mill radians to 6,400, and that's why you see a 64 at the top of a military compass. Now, this rounded number is easier for quick calculations and it still provides the precision you know, needed. So as there's more mills going around the circle than there are degrees, the spacing between each mill is a much smaller than it is for degrees. And this is crucial when you're throwing rocks at things. <laughs> and this is why the military compasses use mills. But it's worth noting that Degrees are still used by the military, you know, for walking around the countryside. And the mills are tend to be reserved for throwing rocks at things. <laughs> I, do, I like that expression. I'm going to use that again. Anyway, let's, let's go. And, I'm going to go and pick up the rock again and we'll continue to use our rock um, to go a little bit more deeper into this um, topic. So here we are again with our rock. I, I will get some uh, technical equipment one day, but until then, <laughs> this will have to do. So I'm going to throw my rock in that direction. And because of my superhuman strength, the rock has flown all the way up to the top of a hill over there. So the civilian approach would be to get a map and a compass, standard base plate compass. And from here, I know my position on the map, so I can take a bearing and I've got a bearing of about 170. So I've got a bearing of 170. So I can either use my compass to, to go to the rock's location, you know, I can just follow the bearing, or I can use my map and I know where I am. I can see the contour lines on the ground and on the map, um, or rather I can see the ground features and I can see the contour lines on the map. And using my compass, I can actually find the rock's location on my map. So that would be the civilian approach. The military approach is, is different, obviously. So let's have a look. Well, I'll use one of these. This is, um, 
This is a Francis Barker M73 compass. These are probably, in fact they are, these are the most accurate handheld compasses that non-military people can get hold of. So here we go. So I had a bearing of 170 and I've got a bearing here. I've got a bearing here of 3,000 and 48 mils, which is actually 171.5 degrees. So this is much more accurate than using uh, my standard base plate. Now, once I've got my bearing using mils or degrees, what I can do is I can get my map, I can use my protractor, and then I can plot the location of my rock on the map, um, because I may want to throw another rock at it. <laughs> you know, that's, so, so that's the basic details or the basic differences between military and civilian compasses. They're designed to be used for different purposes in different ways. There are obviously other distinctions. You know, military compasses tend to use tritium instead of luminous paint so that they glow all night. Um, they'll also be, tend to be built from stronger materials, you know, to withstand harsh conditions. So to answer all those DMs and emails, the basics would be civilian compasses tend to use degrees and have a base plate, you know, to make them easy to use. Military compasses are designed for precision, like, you know, precision tasks like throwing rocks at things, and they tend to use mills, you know, um, and they're also designed to be used with a protractor because they don't tend to have a base plate. So I think it's time for tea and sandwiches over there. I'm, I don't know if you can really... <laughs> I've actually stood here in the rain doing this. <laughs> I'm sure Mr. Beast doesn't have to make YouTube videos in the rain. Now, he, he probably has 10 people running after him with an umbrella and he will make it a competition. Who's the first person to keep me dry? No, let's not go there. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> tea and sandwiches over there. Welcome to my staff canteen. It's not a bad office, is it, really? You know, <laughs> as offices go. Put my tea down here. <laughs> oh, today's sandwich is a very European affair. Let's have a look what we've got. We've got, today, look at this. We've got Greek feta cheese, Italian beef, sliced Spanish black grapes, and English flat leaf parsley. Oh, come on, life is good. Don't forget, there is no excuse for going up a mountain with a lazy sandwich. <laughs> Oh, by the way, Brazaola, if you haven't heard of it, it's a cured beef delicacy from the Lombardy region in Italy. In England, we'd call this um, cut of beef, we'd call it topside or silver side. You know, and after being salted, the, uh, the meat is air dried in a room which is warmed by an open wood fire for between two and three months. And that's what gives it its very distinctive flavor. So do try some. It also is why it's quite expensive. But anyway, it's from the Lombardy region in Italy. Oh, it's really nice. Ciao ragazzi della Lombardia. <laughs> Complimenti per la uh, brezzaola. Forse un giorno farò un video in italiano, ma scusate, dovremmo aspettare perché oggi non ho tempo. Ma come al solito, ora devo parlare in inglese perché gli inglesi sanno parlare solo una lingua. Non so perché. Non è difficile, vero? <laughs> What? Oh my God, I'm waffling in different tongues now. Anyway, <laughs> I hope you now, sorry about that. I hope you, I'll, I'll delete that. I hope you now understand the difference between a military compass and a civilian compass. So thanks for watching.